Hello and welcome to the look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. And with me to do that are theologian and writer Vicky Beeching and also we're joined by the broadcaster Henry Bonsu. Good evening to you Hi. both. Hi. Talk to you in a moment. First let's just have a quick look through the front pages in brief. Uh, we'll start uh, with The Independent which leads on the Labour leader Ed Miliband promising to rescue Britain's struggling middle classes. Here's The Telegraph, uh, which has Maria Miller on its front page. The paper claims she now faces questions over tax paid on the sale of her property. The front page of The Metro headlines the hunt for the killer of a British millionaire found dead in Spain. The Guardian also leads on Maria Miller, saying the Prime Minister is at odds with top Tories over pre as pressure grows uh, on Maria Miller. The Mail's headline is too polite to make a fuss. The paper claims elderly people are enduring appalling NHS care because they're afraid to speak up. The Times front page says Irish terrorist murders should remain unsolved. The Express leads of a story that says drinking milk could stop arthritis getting worse. Here's the Mirror, which leads on a shopping story of an 89-year-old pensioner who kills herself because she can't cope with the digital age. So we're just going to start with uh, the Daily Telegraph, which of course uh, revealed uh, Maria Miller's uh, expenses, uh, led to her having to make that apology and being investigated. Uh, another headline uh, on the front page tomorrow, Miller faces questions over tax on home sale. This is her second home, questioning whether uh, she's paid capital gains tax or not. Uh, well, the BBC has been in touch with Maria Miller's uh, office this evening uh, and a spokeswoman for Mrs Miller says that it's utter nonsense this story. She confirmed that Mrs Miller had sold the Wimbledon home in February of this year and said that Mrs Miller would pay any capital gains tax that was due but that assessment had not yet been made and any tax was not yet due. She insisted that the Culture Secretary would obey uh, HMRC rules to the letter. Of course, you don't pay this year's tax till, till next year, mm -hmm. so, so she wouldn't have uh, been charged capital gains tax yet. Um, but what this does emphasise, and, and what a lot of other newspapers certainly emphasise, is that Grant Shapp's hope of a line being drawn under her expenses isn't going to happen just yet. It's not because uh, the newspapers, particularly the Telegraph, uh, may be succeeding in painting a picture of her as a cabinet minister, a very senior parliamentarian who is whose financial status is being um, enhanced and she's being enriched by her political status and of course we don't enter politics in this country to get rich do we that's what they do in other countries in banana republics the problem for her now is that although she's firewalled a little bit by being one of just five women in the cabinet David Cameron's going to look at her and think, hmm, how much support does she have in the grassroots? People like Tebbit are calling for her to go, how good is she at her job? And then come to a conclusion. I suspect he'll want to keep her for a variety of reasons, not least because she's one of just few, uh, five women in the cabinet. But I think also, hmm, he doesn't want to throw her overboard and he doesn't like getting rid of ministers anyway. Mm. He doesn't want to be seen to be dragged away from position of strength, relative strength, by the tabloid press, no. uh, or even by but the Vicky, it might not be the Prime Minister's uh, decision. Uh, it might be the public's decision. Absolutely, and he needs to really um, make sure he, he tests that water well and, and really reads the temperature. I think um, they'll be hoping, obviously there's a recess in three days, hoping this blows over, hoping it can just quieten down long enough mm -hmm. for that. Um, I do think that, that she is one of few women is really, really relevant in some ways, but in other ways not. I'm a very passionate feminist, but I don't think in these cases somebody should be given more leniency just because they're a woman. So. Um, I really hope that um, he does the right thing. I think there's a lot of irony around this as we look at the I think what Henry was, was pointing out there wasn't just giving her leniency because she's a woman. I think it's, it's about keeping women in the cabinet. Absolutely, so, yeah. but I don't that, think they should be kept the in at any expense is all I'm saying yeah. in response to that, that, you know, just because there are I know, but women, the, you know. It's I know, I know, but the thing is, people have said before, does David Cameron have a problem with women? Is he more patronising well, to women? He doesn't have enough, know? that's for yeah. sure. But um, yeah. I guess leaving her in because she's a woman, even if she's... Mm. I don't know, I just, I just think... I can see where this discussion you know I mean? is ending. <laughs> no, really, this is not the only scene Certainly of heading. who's got rash exactly, out of being exactly, a exactly. senior should, politician. Should we move on to the Times? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, um, there's uh, a, a very different story to, to the other papers on the front page of the Times. This is the headline, Irish terrorist murders should be left unsolved. Uh, this is a former minister calling for this, not the newspaper, for an end to uh, troubles prosecutions. Mm, well, it's um, to do with the Irish state visit to London. So President Higgins arrived today. He's seeing the Queen tomorrow. And Martin McGuinness of Sinn Féin is going to be in attendance also. And um, this is a call for an amnesty on all the unsolved murders that occurred in the troubles, um, saying that they really want to put the past behind them, 
and that unless we can actually do this, um, this will be hanging over um, the relationship um, for you know for the future, where you know potentially we could just bring an end to it. But my sympathies really in this case are with the families of the victims, and I think it's all very well to say let's put the past behind us. But if you think about them, it's yeah. not it's not in any way a, a caring. Uh, well, this is them. the thing. I mean, he's talking in macro, in the kind of big political mm. terms, but mm. these are individuals, these are families. I didn't realise the figure was as high as 3,000 unsolved murders. I had no idea it was as bad it's as high, that. isn't it? No. Oh, yeah, and I'm just wondering whether Peter Haynes' judgment is being, um, I suppose, diffused through the prism of South Africa, because, of course, they did have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and some of the most heinous, appalling crimes committed by the apartheid state were forgiven or were kind of explained away. I mean, that was a process... But it could be that argued that that did help the country move on. You as might say, but there's still a lot of blood and pain mm. and trauma going through the, 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 the... I suppose the psychology of that country, even as we speak. And I don't think these things are just wished away by politicians. No. And what's interesting is uh, there was huge outcry when it was revealed that letters were sent to some uh, yes. IRA suspects. On the runs, yeah. On the runs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there was huge outcry about that and questions over who knew what and when as yeah. well. And so the it, sense of fairness and justice. And he's saying here that you can't can't really apply a sense of normal fairness and justice to a very unusual situation, but at the same time you're still left with exactly. lots of individuals who will not feel like they've got justice. Absolutely, and the big question is what constitutes, and I know they've done this before, but a political crime. An awful lot of murders, how many of them could be directly attached to the troubles and how many of them were just ordinary crimes that have been dressed up mm -hmm. as political crimes? And if you have lost somebody, you will want justice. Yeah. Let's turn to uh, the inside pages now uh, of uh, The Sun. Um, shut door on cheats. Uh, benefits payback by selling homes, uh, says The Sun. Uh, benefit cheats, according to the newspaper, face being forced to sell their homes to pay back debts in a tough crackdown. Well, you could call it that, couldn't you? If you, you could. forced to sell your home to pay back uh, the Absolutely. amount you've cheated the government out of Well, benefits. the big question is how many people are going to be forced to do this? How many people who are, quote, benefit cheats actually own their own homes in the first place? There are a load of figures quoted in this story. They're talking about £414 million pounds of fraudulently claimed handouts, but the overall figure is something like £3.5 billion lost to fraud and error. So the vast majority of that figure is error as opposed to fraud. And it would be really helpful if we knew just how many, quote, welfare fraudsters, as they're describing them mm. here, will really have to uh, pay back by um, selling their homes. I suspect very, very few indeed, but it's a good headline. It's a huge amount of money, £440 million pounds, uh, of debts uh, to be recovered uh, from cheats. Of course, we've got to remind ourselves the Sun has got its Beat the Cheats campaign yes, it has. at the moment as well. Uh, now, uh, the Mirror, uh, shocking front page uh, story. Um, the headline, I'd sooner die than live in the age uh, of uh, the email. This is a British pensioner who uh, evidently killed herself at an assisted suicide clinic, uh, saying she couldn't cope with the digital age. Uh, euthanasia is one issue, uh, the digital age is another. Uh, there are a lot of pensioners, a lot of, not just pensioners, a lot of people uh, struggling to cope with the digital age. This is something you're um, investigating, isn't it, Vicky? You're doing yeah, a PhD on this. Yeah, academic there? research. I'm looking yeah. at the effects of technology on society, and I think this is a... Uh, does this surprise you? Does well, it shock you? It actually does surprise me. I think the symptoms of um, older people feeling isolated by technology doesn't shock me, but this actual result does. She's actually gone um, abroad to um, commit suicide. She died on March the 27th from uh, a lethal dose of um, drugs, and uh, she wasn't terminally ill. She was not seriously handicapped, the paper reports. But um, her comments really were that she wanted to say, stop the world, I want to get off. And uh, that she couldn't cope with the fact that the world was becoming more machine oriented. She felt like we were becoming robotic, that we were losing that sense of relational interaction. Yeah. And uh, for her, that was a world she couldn't, cope, um, she couldn't cope with, she couldn't keep up with it. She's never owned a TV, she's never owned a radio. Well, I, I, when, when I read that, I thought to myself, hmm, there are lots of other things going on here, actually. Because, I mean, when did televisions come in? You know, how, what percentage or of the radio, population? Radio, yeah, radio. And radio. in fact, televisions and radios are lifelines for probably the vast majority of people, particularly elderly people. Mm -hmm. And so I thought to myself, great sympathy here if somebody wants to disappear for these reasons. But actually, I wouldn't blame the email age. I mean, she was upset with people not cooking properly and instead going for ready meals. So, the so whole, you think this uh, is going to raise serious questions and, and, and more debate over assisted suicide yeah, itself? What it, it's about, it what do. it's for, what who should be allowed? What constitutes a genuine what, reason? Yeah, exactly. Like Absolutely, you said, yeah. a responsibility to train yourself 
Yes. Especially now that so many things do rely on... And we're into, we're into lifelong learning as well. And there were lots of other things happening in this lady's life. And I think loneliness was probably at the mm. core of it. Well, I wonder who was around her, because you would imagine you there would be younger people yeah. around, many people that would yeah. help yeah. with those skills. And we should also say, very importantly, there are loads and loads of, quotes silver surface. Lots of people yeah. who are bridging that digital divide. My in the 70s yep. and their 80s, my mum was <laughs> in the 70s. You know what I mean? Parents should be banned from Facebook, though. <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of... Got to sort that out. Uh, on to the independent. Uh, Miliband to the rescue of the middle class. Uh, a reminder, perhaps, from Ed Miliband uh, that at times of austerity, it's usually the middle class that suffer yeah. uh, quite considerably because they, they spend more than they've got. Well, the big question is, who is he talking about? Now, Lord Prescott once said, we're all middle class now. And I'm just wondering whether or not the people that uh, Ed Miliband is talking about are big enough to give him a bounce and a surge all the way through to May next year because there are lots of people in the trades union movement and lots of Labour Party backbenchers who don't think he's quite got his strategy right. So he's going to give a big speech tomorrow about setting our industrial heartlands free and it's an attempt to try and outflank David Cameron and George Osborne. Because the old, message you get from pants. them, uh, from David Cameron and George Osborne, is that the, the economy is recovering. Well, absolutely. But then That's there's all the saying. people in the squeeze middle who don't feel that sense and I think um, Miliband's really wanted to appeal to them to say, you know, the, 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 the tax cuts really are affecting the, the much richer people. You're in the squeeze middle. Things that you value like uh, university education, pensions, getting on the housing ladder, they're all under attack. Under there's no real government. detail though, is no, it? Just it's going to be at the heart no. of his election manifesto. I suppose he's got another 12 months. Well, yeah, yeah, to, to try and put <laughs> meat on the bones of policies. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. the Labour heartlands, um, what will they think of this? You know, the ordinary everyday people, the working class, uh, those people who are moving increasingly mm. to UKIP. Because yeah. this is one of the things exactly. that Nigel Farage says it's not just disenchanted Tories who are going to UKIP. We want Labour people yeah. and they're coming to us. And okay. Miniband may be pushing them that bit further. Could be, possibly. could be, yeah. Uh, we're running out of time, so I just want to move quickly onto the Daily Mail. Too polite to make a fuss is uh, their headline. Tens of thousands of uh, elderly patients are enduring appalling NHS care and they're too frightened or too polite to complain. This is another issue that's going to be at the heart of next year's election, isn't it? How Absolutely. Do we sort Absolutely. Out the NHS? And we're all so aware, aren't we, that we're living longer, having mm -hmm. less money, we're all likely to be struggling when we're older, and uh, this is Britishness uh, at the core, really. Too, too polite to make a fuss, aren't we all yeah. often like that? Well, this is it. I mean, we're talking about the health watchdog, Dame Julie Mellon. She's very, very concerned. There are lots of older people who are in hospital who are too frightened to make a fuss for fear that they will be punished mm. by nurses, by the people who are there to care, if they make a fuss if they complain and the, their relatives are often very concerned as well we've heard of cases of people setting up their own little um, CCTV operations yeah, yeah. in private homes and even in hospitals and they found really appalling and awful care but we should always say that of course uh, most nurses were probably doing a really excellent job yeah, I'm not absolutely. saying this as this is not my um, you know health secretary yeah. chip talking here <laughs> you know I know nurses and yeah. they get really really upset when they see stories like this so absolutely. there are calls uh, for a significant cultural shift and even suggestions uh, that there should be a body that handles all complaints about the NHS, about social care and other services mm. as well. It kind of makes sense, it wouldn't would. it? It would, and people yeah. need to know that there's that behind them. And I think for a lot of older people, they don't even want to tell their families it's true. that things are difficult because they're worried the about being a burden is, on them too. Yeah, so. but the question is, where do you complain when you're in that bed and you're yeah, not getting not water afterwards. and you're yeah. not getting food? Exactly. Henry, Vicky, we're going to leave it there. Many thanks for taking us through the papers. Thank Come you. back again as well. <laughs> Welcome back to the BBC, Henry. Good to see you. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> uh, and thank you very much for joining us for the papers at this hour as well. Do stay with BBC News. Film reviews.